So we're in this Easter season celebrating the living Son, celebrating that Christ is alive. And as Christ is alive, but not physically present here anymore, right? We got to turn to scripture to figure this all out. And so we've been spending some time looking at what it means to understand um, scripture and how to, how to figure it out and how to go to it. And so we've looked at Jesus as the defense definitive unmitigated word of God, um, because when scripture gets a little bit conflicting or we have trouble with it, we look to Jesus as the ultimate authority because Jesus is the word of God that comes directly from God because Jesus is God. So there's no other human involvement. There's no other limitation. It's Jesus. And so that is part of what we use and how we go through scripture and finding out what is that plumb line of holiness and faithfulness. And we have looked at how Jesus used scripture um, in the Hebrew Bible and, and how the prophets and how the law and how the wisdom um, and prayers of his ancestors shaped his faith and informed him. And now today we're going to talk about Jesus himself, the living word that becomes a written word. Jesus didn't give us his own autobiography. He lived. It was all on relationship and teaching and healing and, and preaching. But then he died and he rose. And in a few days we'll celebrate his ascension and, and the coming of the Holy Spirit and this is the church's time, the time when the church is trying to figure out what it means to follow Christ, what it means to be those disciples that go out into all the world, baptizing all and proclaiming the name of Christ. And so in this time, when you don't have email and when you're trying to figure out how to follow Christ and checking in on one another, you write letters. And so letters are the very first books of the Bible that we have, not the Gospels. And the letter that we read to Thessalonians is the first letter, as far as we can discern, um, that was written um, from Paul, um, probably while he was um, in Corinth, um, just after Philippi, to the church in Thessalonica, checking in on them. And you can tell by the ending that we just read that it was expected to be read aloud and shared. Um, um, and in the groups and the congregations and the churches, and as you can imagine, as one community does that and finds his words helpful for figuring out that plumb line, you share it. Oh, did you see this article, right? It's that of the day. And so the letters get spread wider and wider and wider. But the problem of reading somebody else's mail a couple thousands of years later all of those contexts that are implied that everybody knew and understood are now something that we all know and understand. And so part of what is amazing about the letters and the direct advice of on-the-ground work that it gives is also not so direct and on-the-ground anymore. So it's that double-edged sword. And so we spend some time looking in and figuring out a little bit more of what was happening in those um, times and in the city. And so for Thessalonica, we know it just a little bit of research um, that it was a trade hub in its region, and that they were really bent on proving themselves to be one of the best partner cities that Rome could ever ask for. Um, and were really bent on, on currying that favor and getting that good, um, we might even call it a brown-nosed relationship established of the teacher's pet for the Roman Empire, um, and wanted to get the attention and the extra goodies that come along with that. And that's important to know because when you pair that with a church that is following Christ, whose religion is exclusive, it means that people who are following Christ aren't a part of the cultic worship of the Roman Empire anymore. That's a pretty serious undermining current to who Thessalonica as a city is trying to be. The easiest parallel that I can draw for us now is remembering in history back to the time of the Revolutionary War here and how it split families deciding whether to be loyal to the crown or whether to be a part of this revolution. And so families were unmade 
People didn't have their safety nets, their friends, their communities, many again, those who had decided to follow Christ. And so daily living was a moment-by-moment reminder of how different things were now. There was daily moment-by-moment grieving and anxiety and relationships and how to relate, and that was the best of what you could get. Because there was real persecution happening at this time where literal lives and bodies were on the line. And so the best you could hope for was this kind of low running anxiety that would be a part of your life all the time as you're trying to figure out and negotiate new relationships. And we know how that kind of stress eats away at who we are and our confidence and our understanding and our surety of what that plumb line is. So knowing that, Barry, will you bring up 1 Thessalonians again? And the first words in this closing address that happen over and over and over again, brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, if you have lost your family and your community, can you feel the relief that those words would bring to your body, to your soul, that Paul is saying, you do have family. You're not alone. Brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters. That's the kind of truth, that's the kind of reassurance that we get when we go through this. And then, Barry, if you continue, continue when, when Paul is asking for thankfulness from this congregation, um, and comfort and discouragement and rejoicing, Paul's asking a tall order because there's plenty to be upset about. There's plenty to raise your flag of how much you have given up to follow Christ. And then you're asked to be thankful about it. This is one of the greatest gifts that the early church is giving us, that this letter is giving us. That thankfulness doesn't depend on life's circumstances and whether our day has gone well or has gone badly. On whether we've seen God in action this week or whether we haven't. Thankfulness depends on our life of worship. And if we make that plumb line the center, if we make that worship life itself, then there's more room then we can be thankful, we can trust, there can be depth to our life when things are going horribly wrong. And that's the gift that Paul is teaching Thessalonica, and that's the gift that the Thessalonians are teaching us. And how to be thankful, even when the circumstances would make for any other human reaction from us how to make worship, how to make a countercultural identity the very center of who we are and an anchor, a plumb line that keeps us straight through all kinds of storms. And that's exactly what the early church needed. And they put this practice into immediate faithful plumb line usage because they were in a culture that was ready for Jesus to return before they died. And so this letter was written about 20 years after Jesus' death. So even then, right, there's some questioning of what's going on. Why hasn't Jesus gotten his butt back here? Like, what's happening? Is it something that we've done? Is it something that we misunderstood? And the anxiety ramps up and ramps up, and it keeps ramping up because the eyewitnesses have died. They're going, and the anxiety continues. What is going on? What have we gotten wrong? And it would have been so easy for the early church to break at this point, to leave all that Jesus had taught, to say, nope, we got it wrong. Nope, that Jesus, see, I told you we couldn't count on him. But yet there was something as we humans do what we're ready to do and throw it out because it didn't go our way and something is different than what we planned on and expected, 
the early church gave us a miracle. A miracle of human beings being willing to wait. In the midst of persecution, in the midst of impossible circumstances, they didn't let the truth of Christ go. They didn't let the wrestle go. They stayed and they waited and they came together and started gathering what everyone knew about Jesus and they started writing it down. And the gospel according to Mark is the first gospel that we have. Now the gospel accounts are gonna be different. There are different birth stories. When we combine the shepherds and the wise men into the same pageant, it's a little bit problematic because those are two very different gospel birth stories, each with their own truth that they're sharing. And it can be hard for us as we're going to the Gospels and looking at all the differences and saying, but wait, I know that if I'm a lawyer and there's a witness on the stand, I can shake up that person's testimony if I show how that person might contradict her himself. And if the Gospels are contradicting themselves or different, doesn't that raise a question for us? But yet on the other hand, one of the ways we detect if people are lying is if they say the exact same story with no added details over and over and over again as if it had been memorized and rehearsed so that the real truth would not be discovered. So we come with some confusion, some holy confusion, to the different gospel passages. Remember that the Gospels are written generously would be 30 years after Jesus' death, but probably not at least 40, maybe even 50 to 60 years after his death. Years. We all know what happens to our memories, right? When we look back at, at even foundational moments and how things get a little jumbled and out of order time-wise or how we remember different pieces because we were in a different place and needed something differently at that time. That's why we need the four Gospels because they are different lenses on the same truth. And it gets even bigger deal when we're talking about Jesus, the definitive, unmitigated word of God. This is talking about how to put infinite truth into finite words. And so we're going to need some different angles and some different understandings to try to get at a fuller, more whole picture. And so for this church trying to make it through a really rough night and try to figure out how to do this and stay anchored when what they expected was not happening at all, they turned to Jesus' dark night, right? Because if it hadn't been for Jesus dying and then rising again, there'd be no need to remember his birth and his teaching. It's from this moment where all of history changes, where the natural order of being born and living and dying and knowing what death looks like shifts. And that's why everything stays and the church finds a way to move forward. And so we start there. And so we go to Mark. And each Mark, Matthew, and Luke, three of the four, have darkness coming at three o'clock and lasting for three hours. And Mark's gospel is real. Can you hear yourself when you're at that diagnosis, when you're at that job loss, when you're at that death? Say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When Jesus hasn't returned, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's exactly what Jesus cried out in Mark. And in Luke, that was written next. There's something just a little bit different. There's still the darkness. There's still the crying. There's still the loud voice. But instead of why, God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's this moment of trust. Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. 
Jesus hasn't returned. So we have a decision to go into the unknown or to leave it all. And Luke remembers a moment where Jesus could have gone a different route, but saw the crucifixion all the way through, maybe not even knowing for sure in that human moment if resurrection would come on the other side, but trusting God in the unknown. Into your hands I commend my spirit. Can we do the same in our unknowns? Even when we breathe our last? Matthew is the last of these three gospels written and pairs with Mark in the same human cry of forsakenness, abandonment that we remember from last week's sermon is Psalm 22. And here, Matthew adds a lot. Do you guys remember? Or did you even know that at this point, Matthew talks about not just the darkness, but the earth splitting, rocks cracking, tombs being open, and holy people who had died being raised and appearing in the city at this hour? Things get a little grander and grander the farther out that we get from the fish story. <laughs> and I'm not saying this to say that what happened in Matthew is untrue. What I am saying is that by this point, there's more and more understanding of the level that God is playing at. That this is something that involves all the cosmos and earth itself that this is the natural order of life and death being changed, and that that reverberation will happen all throughout our known and our unknown worlds. The worlds where we are living and know, and the worlds of those who have gone before us. Think, Matthew is the later gospel, right? There still maybe would have been some that would have been miraculous because of the shorter lifespans back then, but maybe some still eyewitnesses for Mark. But by the time you get to Matthew, that's getting pretty scant. So the holy people who have died and have gone before are raised. This is the beginning of theology, of understanding and remembering what Jesus said, because I live, so you shall live also. And there's reassurance, okay, Jesus hasn't come yet, but there is life, and there is reason to hope, and there is reason to commend our spirits into God's care in this unknown, even though we feel forsaken and abandoned. Because we know that even then, if we go back to Psalm 22, God is still working to bring forth life from death. These first three Gospels are all very similar. We call them the synoptic Gospels. It means seeing with. And so they're all very, very simil similar. And even though there's some things that aren't in some that are in others, it's, it's a good grouping. That's understandable. But then you have this Gospel according to John. And this is from a community that was not a part of Matthew and Mark and Luke's community. And as human as Jesus appears and the crucifixion in Matthew, Mark, and Luke in John, Jesus is in control. Every step of the way, there's, there's no loud cries. There's not even darkness. And, and everything is in completion. There's no crying out of forsakenness or sorrow. It's after this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished. Rome is not in control here. The soldiers nailing Jesus to the cross, even though it might appear that way, is not in control. Jesus is the one guiding these and in control of all the timing. And he said in order to fill the scripture, not because he actually was thirsty from a human standpoint, but in order to all of this through exactly he says I am thirsty and then he bows his head 
Nope, I, I see, see how easy it is to put them together? There's no bowing your head here. All right, when Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is, oh, it, I was right. Okay, it is finished. And then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He is in control. It is complete. And so what Barry had showed was the crucifix that we're, with we're accustomed to seeing. And this is the very human Jesus. And you can imagine him crying out, and vulnerability with the nakedness and brokenness. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The more frequent um, image of Christ from the early church that we've lost in our time period here is actually this, is actually Jesus as king in front of the cross. And this is the passage that we have from the gospel according to John. I am here, but I am not suffering. I am in control, and I am doing this for you and for your salvation. John is the last gospel to be written and is the most theological. And, and having gained through remembering what Jesus was teaching to begin applying those teachings um, in daily life. And what the gospels teach us, what the early church found in that miracle of being willing to wait is that as many times as there are dark nights, there's also one who is in control. And as much as we feel abandoned and that that is a real response in this faith journey, there is also trust in the unknown and there is also assurance that the one who has done this before will do this again for us, for the world. And so Jesus, the living word, becomes the written word. Jesus, who proclaims the kingdom of God and teaches that, becomes the proclaimed word. And we find out how to be a part of the kingdom of God and how to build the kingdom of God because of who Jesus is. And we find that through the written word that has been shared from the gospel according to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke, and according to John, who all have truth to bring us and who have all given to us the miracle of what it means to wait in the unknown and to have assurance that although we see in part, one day we will know full truth for we will see face to face. So friends, may we know our plumb line, may we know our scripture, and may we be able to follow faithfully. Amen. I'd like to challenge you to pick one gospel this week to read all the way through, to get the whole story, because we're really good at going to the specifics, but read it all the way through to get the flow, and choose just one. And then, you know, in another week, choose another one, and another week, another one, and get the sense of how they change and shift and get the sense of all the truth that each one brings to us. And if you want to go totally extra brownie points, here's the last fun geeky point of the day. Luke was actually one book with Luke and Acts. And so read the gospel according to Luke all the way through with the Acts of the Apostles and watch how the early church applied what Jesus taught and preached. Okay, I'm done being geeky now, but it's just really exciting. It's really good stuff. Okay. And so as we gather together, this is our journey. This is our plumb line, and the better we know it, the better we are able to witness to the hope that is ours in Jesus Christ.